At first, he was simply swept up in the fervor, excited to be part of a group of people who seemed just as passionate about change as you. You found yourself drawn into their magnetism and empowered by their rhetoric. At long last, you were embraced among your people, among those who could see through the lies that your friends and family did not, among those who seemed to understand the world you all lived in better than you or anyone you had ever known, among those who had an answer for everything or a book that contained it. You found the truth, the theory of everything, and at the head, you were inspired by a leader who was kind and knowledgeable enough to show you the way. Some of their practices and restrictions seemed strange at first, but they were always quick to provide an explanation so straightforward that you felt foolish for even asking. You spent hours in their meetings, hours became days, and days became stays in their shared accommodations. They had insights and explanations for your past, and it all made sense. Why couldn't your friends and family see what you could see? Why were they resisting the truth? Your leader said it's because they've been deceived into a false consciousness, and it may even be too late for them. You wanted to keep trying to help them, but they didn't even seem to understand you anymore. Your leader insisted that they're distracting you from the mission, that they're polluting your revolutionary spirit, and besides, why do you even need them when you have us? Perhaps you're not ready yet. Perhaps he was wrong about you. But no, you wanted to prove yourself ready. You wanted to see this promised land. Your leader told the whole group about your second thoughts. You were ashamed, and they were disappointed in you. They needed you to prove your commitment. So later on, when leader exposed a few of your comrades as traitors to the cause, you had your chance to prove yourself once and for all. Ready to pull the trigger. Or perhaps you would see the signs. Perhaps you would escape. Perhaps you'd be able to avoid the fate that so many before you did not. For those unaware, I'm an anarchist. I believe in the radical transformation of our world from below, based on building the powers, drives, and consciousness of people to manage their own affairs without relying on rulers to direct our destiny. I talk about how we can see that change in my video on how we can change the world. So many issues plague our planet, and I truly loathe the systems of hierarchical power that prevent us from controlling our lives. I want more of us to have the capacity to cooperate with others freely, to share our resources, and protect our planet. We need to organize. That much is abundantly clear. And I'm so glad that more of us, at least in my generation, have developed that necessary passion for change. But I'd hate to see that passion exploited and misdirected. Political cults are alive and well. Many on the prowl for recruits, and whether past or present, on scales large or small, they've done significant damage to radical efforts. Of course, political cults are not exclusive to the left. They're quite common in right-wing spaces as well, and some left-wing cults end up becoming more right-wing as they become more cult-like. However, most, though not all, of my focus will be on left-wing cults, because it's quite frustrating to see people who could have done so much good for the cause end up veering off course. With so much at stake and conditions truly ripe for a new crop of cults to develop, we need to understand what political cults are and learn to recognize the signs, looking at historical examples to avoid the emergence of cults and cult-like behavior. We need to understand that none of us is completely immune, and the mindset that you are can leave you vulnerable to the manipulation, pain, and destruction that cults cause, setting us back from real progress. Also, content warning for brief mentions of suicide and sexual abuse, as well as general cult villainy. Cult, according to the Open Education Sociology Dictionary, is a relatively small group that excessively controls its members, who share a set of acts and practices which require unwavering devotion and are considered outside the norms of society. The group is typically led by a charismatic and often self-appointed leader. American psychiatrist John Hodgman describes a destructive cult as one that veers toward remoulding individuality to conform to the codes and needs of the cult 
institutes new taboos that preclude doubt and criticism, and produces a kind of splitting where cult members see themselves as an elite surrounded by unenlightened and even dangerous outsiders. The term cult itself is fairly contentious in sociological and psychological discourse, considered a pejorative by many. Still, for our purposes, we'll be guided by these definitions and further qualifications to identify cults and cult-like behavior. American psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton is renowned for his contributions to our understanding of cults, and in particular, the eight criteria for thought reform that cults employ in order to indoctrinate their members. The first criterion is milieu control. Control, control, control over communication is the foundation upon which other forms of cult manipulation can be built. Cults seek to dominate a person's contact with the outside world and even their communication with themselves, taking measures to isolate members and monopolize their time so that they can't test the group's ideas against external alternatives, because cults are convinced that reality is their exclusive possession. The Church of Scientology's doctrine of suppressive persons to discourage contact with those critical of Scientology is just one example of milieu control. The next criterion is mystical manipulation. Cults claim a sense of higher purpose that supersedes all considerations of decency or immediate human welfare. After all, the cult's ideology is essential to the future of the world, and its leaders are chosen by God, the forces of history, the universe, the masses, or some other supernatural being made manifest in the organization. The cult will then manipulate experiences, scripture, historical events, or recent news in favor of their sole interpretation of reality. Once such manipulations are accepted as legitimate, the cult's expectation of total, unrelenting devotion by members should be considered far from unreasonable. When we say drink the Kool-Aid, you better drink the Kool-Aid. These criteria lend themselves to enforcing another criterion, the sacred science. The group's ideology, or immortal science in some cases, is presented as a sacred moral vision, and questioning its base assumptions is sorely prohibited. Only the cult's ideology offers salvation, for it is the ultimate truth. Why bother even considering another point of view? Cults demand purity, be it of an ideological, spiritual, political, sexual, racial, or other nature. The demand for purity is the next criterion. There are no shades of grey. Conformity is vital. The group's ideas are superior to all others. The ends, which are typically some form of utopia or apocalypse, therefore justify whatever means the organization deems necessary. You can't be a branch Davidian questioning the final prophet David Koresh. And you can't be in the Democratic Workers' Party questioning Marlene Dixon. If you're not meeting the standard, then we will burden you with guilt and shame that you will carry for the rest of your life and pay penance through your work to sustain the cult. Next up is the cult of confession, where members are required to confess their inadequacies and failures in individual or group meetings, breaking down individuality, and intimidating potential dissenters. The Church of Scientology is famous for this in its auditing practice. Trust and believe those confessions of sins and shortcomings or self-criticisms of thought crime will be used against you and the whole process is going to brew a toxic and contradictory stew of arrogance, weakness, shame, and secrecy. Cults will also keep their members in line by loading the language. Part of how they limit thinking and feeling and prevent critical analysis is through the drilling of phrases like the Mooney's heavenly deception, the intense moralization of terms until they lose all practical meaning, like petit bourgeoisie, and of course, the practice of thought-terminating cliches that become the start and finish of any ideological analysis, like revisionism, material conditions, or left unity. To be fair, the problem of loading the language does not exclude the usefulness of certain tombs, including the ones I just mentioned, because as Lifton notes, this kind of language exists to some degree within any cultural or organizational group, and all systems of belief depend upon it. People use thought-terminating cliches in their daily colloquialisms, like agree to disagree, or the parents' favorite because I said so. The problem of loading the language is really about how far certain groups can take their terminology, to the point where it becomes, as American literary critic Lionel Trilling described it, the language of non-thought. By wielding very specific interpretations of words and phrases in ways the outside world typically does not understand, Cults can isolate their members from external communication and constrict their ability to think in an unorthodox manner. 
They can also claim ownership or credit for terms that are used outside of them. See, because it all connects back to milieu control. Another criterion is doctrine over person. Your personal experiences are not relevant. If they contradict the sacred science, tough nuggies, you're wrong. You must be subjugated to the cult's orthodoxy. Furthermore, quote, past historical events are retrospectively altered, wholly rewritten, or ignored to make them consistent with the doctrinal logic. And the final criterion is the dispensing of existence. Only those who adhere to the group's ideology are really fully human, on the righteous path. The rest are seen as agents of evil or barriers to progress whose right to existence is forfeit. Doubly so if they are critics, unless they are saved, made conscious, converted, or recruited to the cult's cause. Lifton's eight criteria can help us recognize when an organization resembles what he terms ideological totalism. But to be clear, as he argues, no environment ever achieves complete totalism. It varies in intensity over time, and it can resurface even after long periods of moderation. Not to mention, even moderate settings may display some signs of totalism, even if they don't take it as far as most cults. Vigilance, therefore, is essential. The eight criteria can be simplified much further into Stephen Hassan's BITE model, which was partially inspired by Lifton's work. The BITE model is a tool for understanding the forms of control found within cultic organizations. BITE stands for Behavior Control, Information Control, Thought Control, and Emotional Control. In short, through restrictions on clothing, housing, diet, sleep, finances, and more, cults control behavior. Through fostering distrust of outside sources and inoculation with in-group material, cults control information. Through a variety of techniques from hypnosis to thought terminating cliches, cults control thought. And through guilt, shame, fear, coercion, and love based on compliance, cults control emotions. Cults come in many forms, from the apocalyptic to the destructive to the polygamous to the political. As authors Dennis Turish and Tim Wolfworth wrote in On the Edge, Political Cults Left and Right, which was a fantastic resource for this video, by the way, quote, We would like to make a general observation. All cults are political in the sense that they construct miniature totalitarian societies. End quote. Political cults specifically are just far more open about their political agendas and inclinations. So let's say, shedding all moral considerations, you wanted to create your own political cult. What would it take? What makes a political cult tick? Well, if you've been searching for a cult construction manual that has been time-tested and proven effective again and again, you're in luck. If we were able to take everything that we've learned about cults so far and distill that information into a handy step-by-step -step instruction book, you'd get Age of Propaganda Chapter 36 where American social psychologists Anthony Pratkanis and Elliot Aronson developed a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a cult leader. Step 1. Create a distinct social reality. You knew this was coming. You can't have a cult without some level of isolation from the world beyond. The tried and true method is to set up a compound in the middle of nowhere, but considering today's real estate prices, if that's not possible, make sure to isolate your members psychologically. Teach them to self-censor critical information to develop their immunity to falsification. Transform their language until it's incomprehensible to outsiders. Busy their bodies with work for the cause and their minds with your unique, enlightened, and all-encompassing interpretation of theory. Inculcate them with the rigid regime of your party and fill their waking moments with repetitive lectures and meetings until their bourgeois mentality has been wholly dismantled and replaced with your own. And here's a bonus tip. Try and get them in on doublethink early. You want them to extol democracy while supporting autocracy, Embrace equality while privileging leadership, and demand free speech from wider society while silencing internal dissent. Step 2. Create an in-group and out-group. Bringing it back to Lifton's concept of the dispensing of existence, make sure to drill the importance of your members distinguishing themselves from the outsiders. It doesn't matter who the out-group is, you just need to have an out-group of some kind that you could direct their fear and anger towards. For far-right cults, Jewish people, black people, and queer people are necessary, tried and true outgroups. Some go as far as to say anyone who isn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant is excluded. But for far-left cults, you can't just rely on the bourgeoisie as an outgroup. That's not isolating enough. You have to target other groups with your eye, like revisionists or ultra-leftists. Step 3. Create a commitment through the rationalization trap. Cults manipulate cognitive dissonance by gradually escalating members' commitment to the group's beliefs and actions. 
If you're Jim Jones, you don't open with revolutionary suicide. You open with small requests for money, then gradually escalate over time. There were even a few mock suicides at Jonestown before the real thing. Each step in the process will seem, you know, reasonable in context, which will trap your members in a loop of justifications and make it harder for them to explain their actions if they want to leave and push them further into the fold. Step four, establish your attractiveness and credibility. Perhaps you're the reincarnated brother of Socialist Jesus, or the next name in the list of is stretching back to Marx. Someday, maybe, you'll have as many statues and paintings of yourself as the Kims. You need to become deity in the eyes of your followers. Whitewash your flaws or deny them outright so that your followers know to do the same. Establish a myth around yourself so that you can get away with doing the things that you don't allow the rank and file to do, like taking the org's funds for personal use or enjoying time off. And when you ask your members to do the extreme, they can justify following through because glorious you ask them to. Step 5. Send members to proselytize. This is tied to step one because in order to keep your members in your social reality, you need them to self-generate persuasion. You need them to convince themselves that they're on the right path, and they do that by trying to convince others. This applies even outside of cult reality, as folks in the habit of sharing their ideology, religion, or philosophy can attest that sharing it with others helps you understand it better yourself. But in the context of cult activity, the practice of proselytizing gives your followers opportunities to defend the cult from outside attacks and strengthen their resolve. It also brings them closer to other members of the cult, which helps keep them tied to the group. Step 6. Distract members from undesirable thoughts. Again, you want to keep them busy, busy, busy. Keep them from thinking for themselves. Too busy or exhausted to question the group's direction or beliefs. Finally, Step 7. Fixate members on a promised land. They need something to strive towards, something to hope for, and something to keep them in line. If they stop for even a moment, they risk putting all of Utopia in jeopardy. And there you go. Follow these seven steps, and you'll have a fairly effective political cult. Now, on a serious note, please do actually go and create a political cult. In fact, if you hear these examples, I think you'll begin to understand just how devastating political cults can be, and exercise more caution in your organizing efforts. Once again, I want to emphasize that my focus is on left-wing cults for a reason. Even without necessarily being cultish, I think those in my audience already know just how much the right's ideologies suck. I don't feel the need to get into the weeds of the Aryan nation, or even the modern pseudo-cult of Trump to illustrate my point. We know they're terrible, we know they're dangerous, I'm preaching to the choir. Now, I don't want to overstate the threat of left-wing cults, because in reality, though abuse and manipulation of such organizations harm and waste the lives of those within them, the bigger threat, obviously, remains the right-wing terrorism that regularly takes lives outside of them. But I believe we need to be a lot more vigilant about the wolves in sheep's clothing than the wolves in plain sight. The figures and movements that talk the talk all the way to destruction. In 1974, 39-year-old Marlene Dixon took over the leadership of a group of 13 Maoist young women, mostly lesbians based in California, who wanted to change the world. This group became known as the Democratic Workers' Party, or DWP. In a world dominated by male-centered organizations, Dixon was a beacon of change. She knew what she wanted to achieve with this group. She studied mass social psychology and group behavior modification, and after reading Robert J. Lifton's work on thought reform, she decided to implement his techniques in her organization. While Lifton saw thought reform as a dangerous brainwashing practice, Dixon picked it up and said, you know what, this is a useful and positive tool for remolding the world. Starts with my followers. The DWP was ultimately Dixon's experiment of totalitarianism. Members pooled their income and resources and were made to work on assigned tasks for 10 hours or more. Dixon's leadership structure and reporting system ensured that she could keep tabs on members' activities at all times. Life in the DWP was hell. She regularly conducted emotionally distressing self-criticism sessions that lasted for hours and launched purges to solidify her authority within the party, targeting dissenting voices, expelling those unable to meet strict demands, and reducing the membership while retaining her tight grip on power. Thankfully, the party collapsed in 1985 due to the demoralization of the decline of the left under Reagan, Dixon's shift in focus from the working class to the petite bourgeoisie as the center of the revolution, the exposure of Dixon's alcoholism, abuse, and other scandals, and just plain exhaustion. In 1974, on his compound in Jonestown, Guyana, 
Jim Jones coerced his congregation of 918 people to commit a revolutionary suicide. Prior to the tragedy, Jones was known for his unique take on Christian socialism that couched his communist ideology with religious language, promoted his own divinity, isolated members from their families, and brought their resources under people's temple control. He warned of a coming apocalypse and provided his religious socialism as salvation. He talked the talk and walked the walk with his efforts to push for racial integration and the temple's social welfare for the poor, the elderly, the disabled, and the drug addicted which earned him the respect of his predominantly black congregation across multiple locations. Yet Jones also prophesied death for those who opposed him, abused members of his congregation sexually and otherwise, and sought to punish defectors from the movement. Fearing persecution for fraud, he relocated his project to Guyana, which he sold as a socialist paradise and ended as a totalitarian nightmare. In 1968, 46-year-old Lyndon LaRouche took charge of a group of young students who wanted to change the world. LaRouche was a Trotskyist in name, but had very little connection to labor activity. He was more of an intellectual, and drawn from Lenin's what is to be done, he came to believe that he should be at the head of the professional revolutionaries that would guide the less advanced masses. Borrowing from Gramsci's idea of hegemony, he saw himself in competition with other intellectuals on the left for leadership. Lerouche's movement began with a seven-hour meeting with his soon-to-be disciples at Columbia University. He intended to groom the next generation's revolutionary intelligentsia. And with what he saw as the looming crisis of capitalist collapse, he figured that only he and his followers could prevent the coming catastrophe. His party grew to 1,000 members. By 1973, Lerouche pushed his group from the far left to the far right, embracing anti-Semitism and inspirations from Mussolini and Hitler propagating conspiracy theories, and ordering violence against his opponents on the left. Within his organization, he tried to control every aspect of his followers' lives, from where they lived, to when to quit their jobs, to what they should read. LaRouche even taught them how to squeeze money from their parents for his cause, and when to break up with their partners. Just as with Dixon's DWP, LaRouche held ego stripping sessions, where anyone who failed in a political task was subjected to pure psychological terror as everyone attacked them and tore apart their past and personal life in front of the whole group. LaRouche ran for president a few times and eventually ended up in prison for his various scams, including credit card fraud. While he was behind bars, much of his group faded away. Don't do it! Don't jump! <sighs> Nobody loves me. The proletariat loves you. Don't you believe in the proletariat? Yes, yes I do. Are you a Marxist or an anarchist? A Marxist. Me too. Revolutionary or reformist? Revolutionary. Me too. Are you a Leninist or a left communist? I'm a Leninist. Me too. Are you a Marxist Leninist or a Trotskyist? A Marxist Leninist, of course. Uh, me too. Which school? Maoism. Uh, me too. Which kind? Mao Zedong thought or Marxism, Leninism, Maoism? Definitely Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Me too! Which party? People's Popular Progressive Revolutionary Democratic League for Labor Unity? Progressive People's Popular Front for Labor Unity? Or People's Revolutionary Democratic Vanguard Front for Labor Unity? I'm with the People's Popular Progressive Revolutionary Democratic League for Labor Unity. Then die, you petite bourgeois revisionist scum! <laughs> uh... All three of the examples I reviewed were inspired by or based upon a branch of the Leninist tradition whether Maoist, Marxist-Leninist, or Trotskyist. I may be accused in the comments of being too hard on my fellow leftists, perhaps by folks who haven't seen my video on leftist unity, but as Mali said, who the cap fit, let them wear it. If you feel personally attacked by what I'm calling out, perhaps it's time to do some self-reflection. I'm not going to skirt around the feelings of people too attached to ideology to treat this with the severity it requires. This is serious business. Its consequences have proven dire, again and again. In the conclusion of On the Edge, Tirish and Wolforth argue that Marxism-Leninism in particular has inherently cultic tendencies in its political practices. The very structure and principles of the philosophy, including its emphasis on building mass revolutionary parties through democratic centralism, demands a level of conformity, ideological rigidity, and authoritarianism that repeatedly contributes to the development of cultic features within these groups, even if to varying degrees. Durish also observed in his Introduction to Ideological Intransigence, Democratic Centralism, and Cultism, 
that there's a worrying trend of concentrated power, dogmatic groupthink, suppression of dissent, and overworking of members within these organizations. With such a clearly observable trend in that school of political ideology, a critical reassessment of its traditional approach to politics is sorely needed. Though to be fair, despite this very particular trend, other nominally left organizations are not immune to the cultic scourge. In 1972, Korean war veteran John Africa, who was born Vincent Leapart, founded MOVE, a Philadelphia-based black nationalist and primitivist organization best known for being bombed by the city government in 1985. You've probably seen this image making its rounds on social media before, but few know much about MOVE beyond it. John Africa founded the group on what he called the Guidelines, a roughly 300-page manifesto on self-reliance, nature-based living, animal rights, and opposition to modern medicine, science, and technology. Since the founding of the group, MOVE members lived communally in West Philadelphia and took on the shared surname Africa, as ex-members of the still currently active MOVE would later allege, life within MOVE was rife with mental and physical abuse, malnutrition, homophobia, colorism, fraud, manipulation, arranged marriage and sexual abuse, and more, disguised by the banner of black liberation and social justice. None of this justifies the bombing, obviously, but the truth must come to light. In 1978, a shootout between Philadelphia police and MOVE members resulted in one officer's death, leading to nine members, known as the MOVE Nine, receiving sentences of up to 100 years in prison. Since then, a few were granted parole or passed away while incarcerated. Not long after the confrontation, in 1981, MOVE relocated to its final fortress in the predominantly middle-class African-American community of Cobbs Creek, Philadelphia. Their living conditions prompted complaints from their neighbors due to the many cats, dogs, and rats running rampant, human and animal waste strewn across the property, weapons code violations, concerns for the health and safety of the often nude children on the compound's filthy conditions, and moves use of a bullhorn night and day to transmit occasionally obscene lectures based on John Africa's teachings. Move members also often accosted or physically assaulted their neighbors as well, taking on a hostile and self-isolating posture against the outside world. As a result of their neighbors' complaints, Mayor Wilson Good authorized the police to execute the warrants on the MOVE members on May 13, 1985. When the members refused to respond to the police's demands, the police shut off their water and electricity and used high-pressure hose water, gunfire, and two one-pound bombs that set a fire which they let burn that destroyed MOVE's building and 61 neighboring homes, leaving 250 people homeless and killing 11 MOVE members, including four children. Cults harm individuals, families, communities, and entire nations. They're not something to be taken lightly. I understand that no organization that seeks to change the world is going to be completely perfect. I don't expect our efforts to forge a better future to be without mistakes. In a sense, every org has the potential to become a cult. That doesn't mean we throw out all radical theory, organization, and tactics as tainted by cults. We must still organize but we must be vigilant of the cultic slippery slope. We must be vigilant of those who cloak themselves in liberatory language, but seek only to empower themselves, leaving suffering in their wake. I've seen some discussions online about conditions today being ripe for resurgence in cults due to the convergence of factors like widespread unemployment, low-paying jobs, and the skyrocketing cost of living, which have left many searching for purpose and connection, which is a vulnerability that cults exploit. Cults thrive in stressful, ever-changing, and uncertain times. Add on top of that our growing acceptance of alternative lifestyles, which can be used to mask abusive practices in the name of culture or religion, the rise of social media cults of personality, lack of media literacy, and misconceptions about cults born from past scares like the satanic panic, and you have the perfect soil for a surge of cults. None are immune to cults. None are too smart to fall for their tricks, and believing that you are leaves your defenses wide open. While knowledge of their tactics is half the battle, we also need to take certain steps to protect ourselves. So here are some tips to help you avoid political cults. First off, you need to learn to recognize the fallacies and biases that cultic belief systems fall into. Tertian and Wolfworth call out how theory influences observation rather than the other way around. An anecdotal bias can cause us to lend credence to stories over robust data. Scientific language may be used to create a veneer of objectivity and irrefutability 
when true science requires an openness to flexibility and critical reevaluation. Cultic belief systems often claim absolute truth, rationalize their failures instead of challenging underlying assumptions, and draw hasty generalizations that oversimplify complex phenomena. I acknowledge that I might be at risk of falling for some of these fallacies, even though I really try to avoid them. To paraphrase Turish and Wolforth in their conclusions, it's very easy to see what we want to see, what our theory tells us to see, what we think ought to be there, rather than what is. Too often I see people learning or being radicalized just up to a certain point, but they're not challenging themselves and pushing further to question new orthodoxies. I see this as a necessary challenge to be more rigorous, though not necessarily more rigid, in learning and exploring the ideas of others while developing my own. In avoiding political cults, you also need to intentionally establish certain buffers. I'm borrowing here from the blog Kielessa on Tumblr, which came up with these cardinal rules of not getting culted. There's the social buffer, which is all about learning what healthy social boundaries are and developing relationships within those boundaries. The esteem buffer is about recognizing that you and every other person on this planet are owed a baseline of respect. The relaxation buffer refers to ensuring you take time exclusively for yourself to rest and recuperate so that you don't get caught up in the flurry of cult activity. And there's the bubble pop buffer, which is about making sure to learn from multiple sources, even ones you don't agree with fully. In chapter 39 of Age of Propaganda, Pratkanis and Aronson offered some words of advice on dodging cult propaganda. They offer suggestions like exploring the motivation and credibility of the source of the communication, based on the evaluation of a leader not on what they say, but on what their actions in the past have shown, and of course, avoid independence on a single source of information, among others. Finally, I would recommend that even if you don't consider yourself one, at least think like an anarchist and take on an anarchic approach to organizing. In practice, I mean embracing a distributed rather than hierarchical power structure, prioritizing consensus instead of top-down directives, respecting individual autonomy and diversity in perspectives, encouraging constructive criticism in meetings and activities, and maintaining flexibility and adaptability over time. Best of luck, be careful, all power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow people. Thanks to the seedlings, the saplings, and especially the roots for making all this possible. Including our newest members, Frank Thun, Rupus Rainfjord, Kendall, and Joshua Eichmeyer. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out my other videos for a range of radical topics. Thanks again. Peace.